I used to join many groups and many Bible studies. I currently am not part of any study group or any reading group, even though I've been asked to join some of these groups. But I refuse to because, very simply, the majority of the people, 99.9% of the people in these groups, have not read the Bible all the way through. And it's not a crime that you haven't read the Bible all the way through if you join a study group, if you're new. But if you've been here a while, at some point, to properly discuss the things that are written in the Bible, I think you have to have read it at least once all the way through. My opinion is that you should read it multiple times. It's the only way to really get an understanding of the Bible. And I think that because people haven't read it all the way through, it leads to a mystery. And it makes people think that there's much more to it than it is. That's why they want all these different versions and they want to see the original Hebrew scrolls. They need this because they haven't read it all the way through. The Bible is one complete comprehensive story, really not much to it. The only question is, are you going to do the things that are written in it or not? To understand the mysteries of the Bible is not going to really get you anywhere. The Bible is about obedience only whether you're going to do what it says. And the people I met are in this never-ending loop of studying and reading. In my mind, I don't know what they're studying because the Most High is looking for obedience. It's not a test that's going to come up later. Nobody's going to ask you what Lot's daughter's two names are. It's not going to be a Jeopardy question at the end of your journey. It's about whether you're obedient or not. And that's the only purpose in reading the Bible and then trying to be obedient to the things that are written in it so that we can be accepted by the Most High. That's your only goal. And people make more of it than they should because in reality, they have no plans on doing anything that's written. So they keep forming groups where we study and look, but then we go back to our regular lives. But that's not the purpose of studying the Bible. That's not the goal, to be obedient, to do what it says. And it's a whole lifestyle change. It's not a tweak. Part of what I started this channel for is to explain verses to people and show them that it's really not any big mystery. There are mysteries. There are things that we're never going to understand until the Most High explains it to us. But the things that we have, we have to execute. And the goal is to find people who understand this and connect with them and try to change your whole lifestyle. But I find that most people are obedient to the Babylon system. They want to sort of, on one hand, keep the Most High's commandments, but, but they also want to be successful in the Babylonian system. Obedient to the Most High, but I want my kids to go to Harvard. I don't think the two are hand in hand. Or I don't see how they can go together. And you look at people like the Amish. Now, I haven't studied the Amish at all, to be honest with you, but they seem to have rejected society and they seem to be completely obedient to what they believe the Most High is telling them to do or what they call God to, to tell them to do. They've rejected society. And I think at some point when you read the Bible and you study the Bible, you should be coming to that conclusion. But for most people, the Most High is one of the boxes that they want to check just in case that there's a test at the end. The goal of this video is just to explain and show how verses are interrelated and how to read it as you go through it. And the more you read it and the more you study it, you will see that the end times, not really a big mystery on what's going to happen. There's no antichrist. There's no two witnesses. The only thing that's left in the timeline is a war. I'm not sure we'll see it in my lifetime, but only the most high knows. Let's start with showing you some of the end verses in Revelation and just an attempt to show you that the prophets saw the same things. John, Isaiah, Hosea, Peter, Paul, they're all in one accord in what they saw. One person may leave out a detail or wasn't shown a detail, but all the verses are interrelated, interconnected. Revelation is not some new thing that was introduced. New information is introduced, little pieces. The Most High would give one piece to one prophet and give another piece to another prophet. The core story is the same. So let's start by reading Revelation 21 verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talk with me, come hither, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And when he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Elohim, and having the glory of Elohim, and her light was unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear and crystal, and had a wall great and high, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, 
which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the twelve gates were the twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, and it was transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Most High, Elohim Almighty, and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of Elohim did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory into it. When we read this now, it's important to make the connection in other chapters and other prophets to get a better understanding. Because what John is talking about here is just an analogy. It's a dream. It's a vision of what he's having. It doesn't mean that it's 100% literal. So to get a clear understanding and to understand that he's not saying anything new, you have to make the connections. For example, in verse 13, when he says on the east three gates and on the north three gates, to understand, to get a better picture of what is going on. So we read Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 31. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And on the east side, 4,403 gates. And one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, and one gate of Dan. And on the east side, 4,503 gates. And one of the gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one gate of Dan. And at the south side, 4,500 measures and three gates. One gate of Simeon, one gate of Issachar, and one gate of Zebulun. And on the west side, 4,500 with their three gates. One gate of Gad, one gate of Asher, one gate of Naphtali. It was round about 18,000 measures. And the name of the city from that day shall be the Most High is there. Ezekiel chapters 40 to the end of Ezekiel or about the end times. You have to connect that with Revelation. So in Revelation, it just says the gates all had the names of the tribes of the children of Israel. But Ezekiel has each gate listed and it names each tribe. And how we know that Ezekiel is about the end and not something that's in the past. It says in verse 35, the most high is there. That will be the name of the city. There's no city like that now. There's no city like that in the past, but it will be that. So when we read Ezekiel, we can get more information about Revelation and get a better understanding. Think of it like looking at a door and just trying to imagine and explain what's on the other side of the door without ever looking. And that's what a lot of people have done with the scriptures. They've taken the Bible and instead of just opening the door to see what's on the other side, they have decided to just imagine it. To get an even better picture of what's going on here in Revelation and in Ezekiel, we can go to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, says the Most High, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, says the Most High, and I will not keep my anger forever. This is about the Most High warning Israel before they get kicked out of the land. The Most High saying that he's merciful. Mercy means that he will not keep his anger forever. It doesn't mean that he will not punish you for your crimes. But the punishment is not a death sentence. That he will eventually forgive Israel. Verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Most High, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers unto every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Most High. So he's explaining why he's angry with Israel. You have to acknowledge your offense, means not blaming another race for your struggles. Verse 14, turn, O backsliding children, says the Most High, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. The Most High is explaining that he's married unto Israel. That's what we saw in Revelation, that the city that he's marrying or he's getting controllership over is Jerusalem and the earth. But Jerusalem is the bride, but he will be the king in that city at this point. He's saying, turn from your ways, you backsliding children, because I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Everybody's not going. Most people will be cut off in the war. So you can't look at the general population and thinking that they're all going or there are a bunch of people that's going to go with you. Your obedience is not going to be measured by what you see around you. Your obedience is going to be measured according to what you read and what you understand. Verse 15, And I will give you pastors according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. 
this is the 144,000. When you read in Revelation, the 144,000, this is where you would connect that. And if I made a video that connected every one of these verses, the video would be, you know, 18 hours long. When he says, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which I'll feed you with knowledge and understanding. We understand this is the end times, the 144,000 that will be teachers. Verse 16, and it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Most High, they shall say no more the Ark of the Covenant of the Most High, neither shall it come into mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. There's no more Ark of the Covenant of the Most High. It's gone. It's never to return. The Most High has taken that Ark. And that's why we read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, and the city had no need for the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of Elohim that lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Ark was a representation of the Most High. He will be there at that point. And when you read Ezekiel, it says, My post by their post, and the Lamb himself will be here. So there is no need for any Ark of the Covenant in the end times. When Jerusalem and the Israelites are gathered, there will be no need for any Ark of the Covenant. They will have their king and their Most High will be with Israel at that point. There will be a sun and there will be a moon, but there will be no need for it to light the city. Verse 17, And at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Most High, and the nations shall be gathered unto it, the name of the Most High, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. When we read this now, it says, They shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Most High, and the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Most High, to Jerusalem. This is about the end times when Israel is gathered from the land of the north and from all the places that the Most High has driven them. And that's what we see in Revelation. It's the same event. In Revelation, it says the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings do bring their glory into it. The nations that are saved means that they were spared, they didn't die in the war, and they will be obedient to the laws of the Most High. So anybody who's telling you the laws of the Most High are done away with, they don't understand this entire book of the scriptures, because everybody's going to be obedient to the law. And that's why in Jeremiah it says, in those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land. This is when they're gathered, they're going to be back in the land, the gates will be set up, the walls will be built, and the Most High will be among his people at this point. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation, pretty much all the same thing. The future is all the same in all of these scriptures. Verse 19, But I said, How shall I put thee among the children, and give thee a pleasant land of the goodly heritage, and the host of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shall not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O you house of Israel, says the Most High. In Jeremiah verse 19 and 20, it kind of goes back and forth. In 19, he's telling everyone how Israel will inherit the land. But in 20, he's saying how evil they are. That's the way Jeremiah is written. To understand what he's saying in verse 19, how shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land? a goodly heritage, a host of nations. How can I take you, this evil people, and give you this land, knowing how evil you are, and give you a land and make you the host of nations? The host of nations means in Revelation, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. How can I make you the host of nations and teach other nations the law when you yourselves are evil? How can I do that? And the only way he can do it is by writing the law in your heart. This is not done yet. There is no second covenant at this point. He can't make you the host of nations. He can't make Israel the host of nations until he puts the law in their heart. Because until this day and this time, they are completely an evil group of people. The people you see around you now are at their core evil. I don't care what they say, what comes out of their mouth. The people I met were evil at their core. And the only way they can be fixed is if the Most High himself puts the law in their heart. And to understand that better, um, let's read Hosea chapter 2, verse 16. And it shall come to be at that day, says the Most High, thou shalt call me Ishai, and shalt call me no more Balai, for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. 
And in that day will I make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and make them lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. Again, this is the same thing. Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation. To the start at the top, verse 16, Thou shalt in that day call me Ishai. Ishai means husband, and not call me no more Baali. The word Lord and all the other names that we have for the Most High are not his proper name. I know a lot of people want to think that we have the right name, Yahuwah, Yahawa. It's okay to use those names until he gives us his name, but we don't have it. Got to come to grips with that. Jeremiah says, How can I make you the host of nations? How can I make you the host of nations? Thou shalt call me my father and shall not turn away from me. Hosea says, you will call me Ishai and no more Baali. He will make a covenant with us. And that's what we see in Revelation. Israel will be the host of nations. Hosea says, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and loving kindness and mercies. Revelation 21 verse 9 says, and I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. These are all connected. Jeremiah 3.20 Surely as a wife treacherously departs from a husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me. The wife of the Most High has been treacherous, but he will again accept her at one point. To sum this all up, the Bible is just one giant story interconnected. I'm going to keep showing how all these verses are all talking about the same thing. At the end of the day, it's okay to study this, but you should be studying it in a way to be obedient. You should be obedient to what we read in hopes that we will be accepted and the Most High will have mercy on us. Don't look for any big crowd. Don't judge yourself by looking at other people. Each person has their own rules and their own standards that they're going to be judged by. And we should all be trying to read this book in its entirety to be as close and to have a better understanding so that we will be accepted. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.